Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this exciting series, we're going to be building this ridiculously over-the-top squishy toggle. Starting from the ground up, we're going to be going into minute detail about everything on this one, which is why it's going to take three to four episodes to complete. A word of warning though, I'm going to be leaning heavily on layout guides and the pure Swift UI framework in general for this one. But don't worry, I will be calling out to native implementations where possible, and for those of you that don't want to install a third-party library that is going to improve their lives immeasurably, I'm going to be supplying not only the source code for the episodes as we go, but also the native implementations. So if you really want to punish yourselves, you can. So now that you know what we're going to be doing, let's actually do it. Right, here we go, and as promised, we're starting from a blank canvas, and the first thing we're going to do is define the frame of this toggle. So let's put the shape for that frame in right now. It's going to be a private shape called toggle frame. And I happen to know we're going to need a debug property for this. So I'm going to put that in now. Private let debug, which is a Boolean. I'm going to set it in a custom initializer. With a default value of false. Now that we've got our shape defined, we can refer to it in the body. And I'm going to put it inside a geometry reader. So we go up here, put a geometry reader in, and then we can refer to our shape. This frame does need a debug property. So I'm going to put that at the top level in the body so I can have control over it whenever I like, but I don't want it to be part of the public API. So debug equals true. And then I can refer to it here, debug, debug. Now I've put this inside a geometry reader because I want to have full control over the dimensions of our toggle. I want the width to be twice the height. In addition to that, I want to be able to fit this toggle inside any frame. And that means I've got to account for when the height is bigger than the width and when the width is bigger than the height. So we're going to do this calculation in a function and I'll explain what we're doing when we get there. So I'm going to say func calculate size, and that takes in a geometry proxy, and it returns a CG size. At this point, we want to know what is double the height, because the logic goes like this. If the width of the frame in which this toggle exists is less than double the height, then we base the dimensions on the width. Otherwise, we'd base the dimensions on the height, still constrained by the fact that the width is going to be twice the height. Let double the height is equal to geo height scaled two. And now we know what double the height is, we can compare it to the width and act accordingly. If the width is less than double the height, we want to return a CG size with a width of the width and a height of half the height, like that. Otherwise, we want to return a CG size based on the height. Else, return CG size with double the height for the width, and the height is going to be the actual height. So that should sort us out as far as where we need to be to constrain our toggle to the frame in which it is placed. And now we can calculate our size we can use that in the body and then set the frame. So we say, let size equal the calculated size from the geometry proxy. But I don't want to put it on the frame itself. I want to put it on a Z stack around the frame because this toggle will comprise several layers. So why not start now with the toggle frame at the bottom of a Z stack? So we say Z stack. And then we say frame size. Now let's resume. And now that we've got our frame in place, you can see that the toggle is actually taking up the top half of our frame. So if I move it down to the geometry reader, you can see the size of the geometry reader. I move it back up to our frame and it's at the top. And this is because geometry readers are greedy. And if you don't do something about it, your views end up at the top left inside a geometry reader if they are not greedy views. I go into a bit more detail on this in the Geometry Reader episode, which I recommend watching. But ultimately, we need to make our toggle 
have a greedy frame so it can exist in the center of the geometry reader. And we do that by putting a greedy frame around our frame. Greedy frame, just like that. If I move our cursor up to our toggle, you can see that it's now in the center. Perfect. In order for us to be able to see the extent of our toggle at all times, when debugging at least, I'm going to put a faint border on our Z stack. Border, if, debug, color, gray, with an opacity of 0 0.2. A very faint border so we can always see where our toggle actually is. The next thing we want to do is put some styling on this toggle, which is going to give us something that we can use while designing it, but when we set debug to false, we'll show the actual shape in its true glory. So we're going to put a styling on toggle frame itself, not an extension on shape, and we can also take advantage of the fact that toggle frame already has a debug property in it that we can leverage. So we go down here and we say funk, styling and remember we can call it styling because it's specific to toggle frame we don't have to call it toggle frame styling to be more specific because we can only call it on toggle frame so we say styling and this takes a color and it returns some view and if we're debugging we want to return a stroke color of black with a line width of two. Otherwise, we just want to fill it with the color. Now, in order for this to work, we need to annotate this function as a view builder, all right, because we are resolving to different types depending on whether or not we're debugging. That's very easy. We just go up here and say at view builder and we're done. So we can go back up to our view and now we can just say styling with a color of green for now. That's what we're going to make it. We're almost ready to start constructing our shape, but at this point, I want to add a layout guide config. If you're not familiar with layout guides, I've done a whole series on them, so you might want to consider watching that if you want to be brought up to speed, although it should be fairly obvious what's going on. And the layout guide config is going to allow me to define points as coordinates, which is going to make the shape construction very simple indeed. I'm going to declare this in the body so I can see real time updates as I define this thing. Let frame layout config is equal to layout guide config of type grid with the following columns and rows. It's going to have columns at 0 0.25, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 0 0.75, and it's going to have two rows. And now that's defined. I can overlay that onto our shape so we can use it literally as a guide, like we're tracing over our shape. So I go down here, layout guide, and I pass in the frame layout config. And in order to see it, I go down to our geometry reader and say, show layout guides based on whether or not we're debugging. And there you can see our layout guide. By default, it's got faint gray lines on it but we can change that if we want. So we can go up here and say that the color is equal to green and the line width is equal to two. So it's nice and visible. And now you can see all of those important points. You'll see why they're important when I start defining this shape. But if I change one of these, you can see how it moves things around the grid. But I'm happy with that because I know that grid works. Obviously you can play around with this in real time and do that, but now that we've got a frame layout config that works, we can move it to the file level so we can refer to it in our shape. So I move that up here, make it file private, and now I can start building the shape after we resume. All right, now for the exciting part. We've got everything in place and defining the shape itself is going to be very simple indeed, or at least relatively so. So let's go down to our shape, and the first thing we do is lay out our layout guide in the rectangle that we're given. So we go up here, let g equal frame layout config laid out in the rectangle. And at this point, we've got access to all our coordinates. The next thing we need to define is the radius of the arc that goes around the two sides of this toggle. 
That's very easy. Because they're circles that are constrained by the height, we know the diameter is the height, and therefore the radius is half of that. So let arc radius equal half the height. And now we can start drawing our shape. The first thing we need to do is move to this coordinate on the grid, which is 0, 0. Path, move, g, 0, 0. And we're there. The next thing we want to do is draw a curve to the middle of the top of the rectangle. Pure Swift UI defines these semantic constants that are available throughout Swift UI for many things. So CG rects have them as well. So I can refer to that point as the top of the rectangle. So let's draw a curve now. Path, curve, and we're going to the top of the rectangle. And the first control point is this point on the grid, 1, 0. The second control point is the same point, 1, 0. And then we're going to do something really fancy, and we're going to show the control points based on whether or not we're debugging. And there you can see our beautiful curve, which looks nothing like a curve. However, that's to be expected because we are not offsetting that point. And that is what we ultimately need to do when we make our squishy toggle. So for now, I'm going to put in a constant that will represent this offset that we're going to be animating, like this. Let the curve y offset be equal to the height scaled 0.18. Now we've got our offset, we can use that to offset two of these points, the second control point and the point that we're going to. y offset and we give it the curve y offset. And we do the same thing for the second control point. y offset, curve y offset. And now you can see if we're animating that, that is going to give us the movement that we want in this shape. Let's put the next one in, which is going to go to this point. Path, curve, and that is going to 3, 0. The first control point is going to be 2, 0, which is this point. And the second control point is also going to be 2, 0. And we're going to show control points. But the first control point is the one that we want to offset, okay, by curve y offset. So the second control point of the first curve and the first control point of the second curve, as well as that central location, are going to be moving in unison. So we maintain that continuous curve. And if you haven't seen my episode on Bezier curves and why that's important, you might want to watch it. It will explain all of this. And the next thing we want to do is put in the arc going around the edge of our toggle on the right. Path, arc, and the center of this is going to be this point on the grid, which is 3, 1. G, 3, 1. The radius is the arc radius, of course. The start angle is the top, and the end angle is the bottom, and we're going clockwise by default. So that's all we need to define. And now we are at 0 0.3,2. And now we want to draw a curve to the bottom of the rectangle that is then being offset by the same amount, but in the opposite direction. So path curve, and this time we're going to the bottom, which is going to be offset in the opposite direction, minus curve y offset. The first control point is going to be 2, 2. And CP2 is going to be the same point offset the same as the bottom point, minus curve Y offset. And then we show control points based on whether or not we're debugging. And the final curve looks like this. Path, curve, 0, 0,2. Control point 1 is going to be the coordinate 1, 2 with the same Y offset as the other two. Curve Y offset. CP2 is going to just be 1, 2. And then we show control points based on whether or not we're debugging again. Now we're almost there. We've just got to connect it up with another arc. So path, arc. We know the center for this one is going to be this point, which is coordinate 0, 1. G, 0, 1. The radius is the arc radius start angle this time is the bottom, and the end angle is the top. And then the last thing we need to do is close the subpath. 
And if I go up here and turn off debug, there's our toggle frame all ready to be animated in the next episode. So join me for that. It's going to be brilliant. If you're enjoying it so far, don't forget to hit the like button. It helps people find the channel and there's nothing that makes me happier. Unless, of course, you want to subscribe. That probably would make me happier. Who knows? Let's find out. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.